Hi folks, this is um, possibly one of the more major parts of this, uh, of this unit. It's a lot of separate examples of uh, AI, IT, and deep learning in health and medicine. And uh, we just, these are not terribly coherently presented because the world is not terribly coherent at the moment. All right, so this is this uh, healthcare company, Geisinger. And they have an AI system for interpreting CT scans. And it just um, drastically, uh, not surprisingly, drastically improves performance. Nine, nine hours to 19 minutes. And um, it identified uh, a CT scan from somebody with uh, some sort of um, bleeding in the brain, which was not otherwise identified, and basically what this do when they find a signal, they bump up that particular CT scan for the uh, radiologist to, to look at. So it's actually just changing priorities. It's not actually making decisions. So that's a, that seems a solid win-win situation. Okay, here is um, an AI test test for diabetes, and it uh, comes from. Uh, Group in Israel, Weizmann Institute of Science is a very well known university in Israel. And um, it analyzes electronic health record data and it um, identifies the possibility of this at the start of pregnancy. And it um, therefore can help to uh, decrease mortality for the mothers who, uh, who uh, need special care. And um, the half of this uh, discussion is about this nice term, social determinants of health. Namely, that uh, such an analysis has to be customized to your particular area. And so it probably wouldn't be directly applicable in the USA. But it sounds rather unlikely if it won't be modifiable. And it gives here that um, this uh, Currently in the US, there's a strong ethnic variation in this, uh, in this particular disease. Uh, precision medicine, well, precision medicine is not very well defined. Basically means you uh, um, produce a health strategy which depends on the patient. Well, that's obviously something where AI is gonna be totally critical. Because there's going to be AI, which is, drives personalization for everything in other areas. So this is personalized, really personalized medicine. Uh, the examples here are adverse drug reactions, um, which can be mapped through, which can be identified through DNA, and actually other issues. You can just, you can obviously train a deep learning network to. Uh, by, with the existing adverse drug reaction data to see what uh, drives, that, which, which actually is the best way of doing that. We can do better diagnoses, we effectively looked at that, and that gives you better treatment. They can look at, uh, they can do custom cancer treatments, and um, you can identify cancer earlier, so-called stage zero, and um, IBM Watson was an example of actually, unfortunately, not a terribly successful system because probably it was a bit oversold, which actually analyzed a lot of this information against uh, existing literature to uh, get the best possible um, input into any decisions. There's this uh, health company in Utah which uh, looks at genetic variants to help uh, oncologists make treatment decisions and. Uh, do better in curing um, cancer, and there was a sort of 92% improvement. That's great. I'm sure all this will work. Quite how soon and which area will work best is not so clear, but uh, <coughs> anything to do with images is likely to be the best, or anything which can be trained. If you have training data, then you can really do a good job, but you can train on anything, not just images. You can just Feed in patient um, specifications or EHR lab lab results, and then you can train that on those things to identify which particular 
um, information signals a particular problem. Uh, so oncology is um, going to be uh, a major impact because of the uh, image-based uh, nature of some of the analysis, and also how important it is to avoid errors. And I gather errors are quite common in this thing, in this uh, field, because it's probably pretty tricky to know the best possible way of, of tackling it. And there was lots of malpractice uh, money. We've mentioned that already. And um, so, as cancer, uh, well, everything in life keeps on costing more. So AI power precision medicine is likely to be a very, perceived to be a very useful thing to do. And the consumer's willingness to do genetic testing to assess cancer risk should AI, should them help. How much of the AI is really based on genes and how much on actual images is not quite clear to me. Um, I don't know that there's that much evidence that this is a dramatically impressive thing, namely that your gene is significantly valuable. Uh, I didn't see that documented. That's something we should do some research on. Okay, here is another cancer one with Microsoft. All that we learned at the first slide of this whole um, whole unit that big tech has got lots of investments in health for obvious reasons, because uh, it's um, a natural thing for them to work on because they have the experts who are able to do this and. Um, Cervical cancer is, meant is, I gather, preventable but not diagnosed. And uh, a quarter of the world's deaths in this area are actually in India. And um, this comes from going through pap smear samples and other types of data to obey fine choices again. This is not actually making a decision, it's telling the doctor which patients to really look at. And this gives a huge increase in. Um, performance and identification of the difficult problems. Um, this uh, chart here shows a very low incidence in the North America and a rather high incidence in India. All right, here is a reasonably simple but possibly, presumably extremely useful piece of software to help uh, ultrasound software choose where to take images of the of the patient. And um, this is so-called echocardiograms. And um, this basically, you don't need the expert to position the device to take this, these pictures. Uh, the software is called Caption Guidance because the company is called Caption or Caption Health. And um, again, this will free up more time of specialists. So at least initially, it is mainly expected to help the specialists rather than um, take away their jobs, because this is really a, uh, to help them do an easier job, a better job. A heart monitoring and uh, Verily uh, teamed up with uh, electrocardiogram to develop monitors for uh, uh, um, variations in heart heartbeats and things, and um, they have an image analysis system to ultra to an automate analysis of ultrasound based heart scans. Um, well, this general uh, problem of um, the heart being impacted by the uh, the blood and things is um, a giant problem, a trillion dollars by 2035. Uh, anything that can be done to uh, to forecast these problems is obviously a good idea. Robot nursing aids. So here we have a sort of totally different type of application from the robot world. You have all been and had your blood taken, and it's pretty tricky to have your blood taken because you have to get press the needle in the right place. And uh, I gather that they managed to train a robot to press the needle in the right place, and um, well, it only well, it says it's 97%, but that's with people with easy to locate veins. Presumably, those of us with not so easy to locate veins uh, may not find it so easy. In any case, um, 
Inserting needles into veins is, um, I gather, the most common clinical procedure in the world, and 1.4 billion procedures annually in the US. And so, as this is non trivial, 27 of the patients without visible veins, 40% without uh, palpable veins, and 60% of emaciated patients uh, failing to do this right, the automatic robots can. Uh, presumably help if you can really train them to do the right answer, which probably you can. There's probably a set of rules you can instantiate. So this is a combination of vision and touch. Well, this is a fun one, using AI to determine beauty. So the plastic surgeons are all working on pretty beautiful people to make them more beautiful, or, or anyway, various. Um, added beauty uh, processes, and I would imagine all these uh, uh, fake image-based systems, uh, uh, GANs and things, will do an incredible job in deciding how to uh, do this in the optimal fashion. So this will not only make people more beautiful, they'll probably do it cheaper, because you'll probably be able to find all the possible ways of making somebody more beautiful, which is the easiest and cheapest to do. Of course, the plastic surgeons may or may not like the cheapest one. I'm not certain. Probably, probably there are lots of. Probably they can then expand their business to more people. All right, here is a um, take, taking blood tests. While well, this is, all these diagnostics are highlighted by the problems with the coronavirus, which is whose diagnostics are very badly done, and uh, this one can analyze DNA taken in a sample and match. Um, identify infections and match it to a thousand diseases. And uh, this is a $2,000 test. Not quite certain why it costs $2,000. Uh, whether it's the uh, the device that you use or whether it's the software running. The software running should be essentially free after it's trained. Um, anyway, so finding so-called cell-free DNA, DNA not attached to the human cell. And that comes from uh, these nasty things that invade us. And then you just uh, analyze those to um, with a standard Illumina sequencer. And um, then draw conclusions. So this, this type of thing, I think, is a sure win. The more we can do, move to telemedicine and doing more at home, this is a low, 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 um, some sort of modest form of telemedicine where we don't actually do the full thing. We just have a set of things we can do at home that's bound to be very helpful. It would assure help with this coronavirus. Here we have stroke detection, um, which is again uh, looking at uh, CT scans. And this is again a classic image problem. And then alerting the, the specialist. This is, we've seen this so often. Um, that um, and this is where a company called Viz.ai, which was earlier stated as one of the ones whose software had already been approved, and um, it's been used in 300 hospitals, and it has the uh, standard but still very important uh, feature of just making it uh, making it much easier and quicker to uh, give treatment. Um, opioid addiction. Well, opioid addiction is, I guess, some. Um, the signal for that can be uh, the user's breathing pattern, um, which uh, I gather the opioids affect your respiratory system. And uh, this again is a simple, relatively straightforward local device that identifies problems. And um, this is digital therapeutics example from the company called Pear, which was um, I think purchased by Novartis. And um, this is the fancy way of saying opioid addiction, substance abuse disorder. And uh, I gather there were 70,000 deaths last year. Um, and um, obviously solutions um, can be any solutions or any ways of alleviating it will be good. All right, here we have a fun thing, namely nice hugging, hugging robots. 
Um, uh, so we have Cloy robots with uh, conversational AI capabilities. I remember I went to uh, the Consumer Electronics Show a few years ago, and I was amazed by the number of AI part cuddly teddy bears. Every AI researcher uh, in the world, these all the better ones, had a cuddly teddy bear startup, which was uh, trying to learn, talk to you. It's like Alexa, but it, Alexa sitting in a teddy bear and is meant to learn what you, how to keep you happy. And uh, this is obviously particularly relevant for patients. And um, so. This is, again, can have AI built into it. And uh, could the same robot can actually monitor the results from, the, from any devices there. All right, so that's, here is the robot pictures. They're, they're really sort of sweet, but not terribly exciting. Here is a comment about 23andMe, that's 23andMe. This is Ancestry.com, this is the rest. And this just points out that um, there's a growing interest in genetic testing. Um, and um, it's actually, although this is growing, it does seem to have reached a sort of arm pass because I'm, I actually have a 23andMe sample. But all it does tells me is, hey, Jeffrey, another Another um, 60 people have joined 23andMe, and they are 0.8% or less matched to you. Because the only things they find, at least for me, are, are obvious near relatives where the match is much higher. And the rest are all you know, many cousins removed. And uh, about four gener five generations back, they branched off. And so I don't see that's very exciting. Uh, here is a certainly separate topic, the uh, digital health funding. And this is sort of actually a little like um, the funding of FinTech. It's sort of peaked in 2018. FinTech, if you remember, peaked at that time. Um, and notice when it all started. Again, started that we really screwed up. Around 2013, where we had leadership in many, many relevant areas, we should have just set up our own company, do any of this stuff, FinTech, blood tech, whatever, image tech, everything. All right, here is sort of um, an interesting comment, which I sort of hinted at already. Namely, the genome has not proven to be quite the revolution that was expected. There are some things you can detect with DNA, but you can't go and I mean, this is why 23andMe and people are having trouble. You can't go grab somebody's genome and say, mm, you're going to have um, Alzheimer's at 62, uh, broken blood vessel at 73, etc. It is not very precise. It's a pretty complicated to go from the genome to the problems. And this vision that the genome would be your uh, your, all you needed to look at to do the personalized medicine is not shown to be successful. And articles that it appears 30 years ago suggested that the opposite have been withdrawn. And there is no very simple way of mapping a gene into illness. Um, there are some, there are a few cases like Huntington's disease, which are very clear, and I say we've mentioned these things like identifying genes from the coronavirus, which are clear, but or DNA, I should say. But um, most serious diseases are not caused by single gene mutations, and they cannot be cured by replacing the bad gene with a better gene. So there are going to be some cases where gene therapy will succeed. But it's not the universal thing on which, which um, personalized medicine is built. In fact, if you look at what personalized medicine is being built, it's being built on the things we already mentioned, imaging, <coughs> AI analysis of EHR data and things like that. Um, more actually, it's still AI, but it is not 
genomics based AI. It is deep learning analysis of a variety of different uh, signatures of the human health. This is a more um, general comment of, for the whole of this uh, course. Um, not that there is genomics is an area we learned was just not going as fast as it ought to. Uh, consumer robotics is also pretty slow. I've already commented dozens of times that VR and augmented reality uh, have, haven't been taken off. And blockchain is still struggling to be the great success it's meant to be. If we look at healthcare, this company, Business Intelligence, said that blockchain will move to the forefront. But it ain't true. Um, and there was a, a pilot program, and um, there's a claim of a blockchain solution in 2023. Well, nobody can think that far ahead. Um, and by uh, blockchains, uh, sorry, business intelligence said that the other, they did make a, a negative prediction that was correct, namely that telemedicine would not take off in 2019. But actually in 2020, due to the coronavirus, it could well take off. So that has changed. Because treatment at home, the ability to be able to treat disease patients away in a suitably social distanced way has proven to be very successful. Um, here we have another acceleration of AI, which is using trained networks, presumably, which is looking for medication errors. And presumably, you can easily, rather well, straightforwardly train networks to map medications into yes or no as, as a good idea. And they uh, claim to have had a 92% uh, efficiency. But the, and again, this type of software doesn't actually have to um, reliably get the answer. It just has to give to the doctor a, a, a sample of, of um, medication strategies that look suspect. So this is digital therapeutic. Um, here is sort of um, a totally um, uh, off base things, um, which is that um, you can often find events from information implying the event. I remember a long time ago, uh, one of my, um, we, you know, the very early informatics undergraduate class, we were, we did a study which other people have also done at the same time or probably before. How you can actually find out about earthquakes from tweets before the US Geological Survey tells you about it. Similarly, the Wuhan virus can be detected by, um, by information on the web before it becomes clear to the, uh, the people whose business is to um, uh, predict these things. And there was a company. Blue Dot that discovered the epidemic at the end of December, and the CDC found it on January 6th, and the World Health Organization January 9th. And this was just uh, an AI-driven algorithm which does information retrieval. It analyzes text and looks for uh, signatures which are indicative of particular um, health-related events. Notice this failed for Google flu. Because it tried to look at, um, uh, I don't know, tweets or equivalent about uh, flu and got the wrong answer. You know, it, it, uh... Okay, here we have um, Fitbits. And uh, I've always wondered that Fitbit does a very poor job of actually using the data that uh, these watches send back to Fitbit Central. And actually, I don't know. Um, I mean, the Scripps, which is a very well-known San Diego-based uh, institution, it actually got identified data from 200,000 Fitbit users, and they were able to detect rising heart rates and changing in sleep patterns, which predicted flu outbreaks in real time. Of course, they did it later on after Fitbit gave them the data, and it was not done in real time. So, um, and this chart here just says that. These wearables 
are getting more and more popular. Here's the number of people with wearables such as this. And um, I don't think this is a great device, but it's certainly a useful device. And uh, of course, Google has now purchased Fitbit, and so hopefully it will get uh, maybe more resources put into it to get uh, something which might vaguely compete with Apple Watch with an Android uh, interface. And um, and also maybe the data will actually be analyzed in a thoughtful fashion. So that's promising. Well, here is the old Watson type project, which is actually done by Microsoft called Project Hanover. And they this is AI technology to read specialized medical and um, documents and research papers, which they can for, uh, which they then summarize for a knowledge base. And they obviously just look for tags, chemicals, um, diseases and things like that. And then this one particular one was looking on for cancer. And um, they uh, then used the ones they identified and extracted information from it. Because you know there's so much research and work in this area, no one person can possibly keep track of it. Uh, well, here, as I mentioned already, the voice was very promising. And um, this last slide in this set of example is voice recognition. And uh, it's basically doesn't do, it's not the obvious voice recognition of say chatbots. So I dial into my coronavirus on the web website and the chatbot tells me whether or not I'm about to be uh, sent off to a ventilator. Rather, this one is for doctors and doctor interactions with patients to try to generate notes. And uh, it allows the doctors to document their interactions with patients much faster. And um, obviously, this could be this bound to work. Well, Suki may not work, but this concept has to work because voice recognition is so good. All right, so this is the end of this uh, set of examples. Thank you very much.